Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Craft of the Draft podcast. We're getting nearer and nearer to draft day. And as usual, I'm one of your co-hosts, Nathan Seppi, joined by my other co-host, Jonty Ralph-Smith. And today, we're going to be reviewing the Vic Metro teams, looking through the top prospects, but also the under-the-radar prospects, as this channel is all about. And, Jonty, let's get right into it. We'll start with the Eastern Rangers, who got all the way to the granny in the end and just fell short. And, you look at their top prospects of Watson and Windsor and, you know, especially Windsor, how much he's done throughout the year to, to get to where he has been. But I'll start with a defender who I know one that you've been tracking throughout the year and has had some good bits and pieces of footage during the year, Cooper Trenbath. Where's he sit at this point in time and what do you make of his season in general? Yeah, his season's been an interesting one to track because he had that really big game against Sandringham in round one. I think he took nine intercept marks and really put himself on the map. And when you're doing it against Sandringham, there's obviously so many recruiters there who are interested in watching all the Dragons' prospects. And then following that, he had a bit of a finger injury and was a little bit down on form for the rest of the first month of the season. So just missed out on Vic Metro. But then had a really big game out at Calder that I watched where he took 14 marks and it was, again, able to show how good he is overhead as that defender. And then certainly in the back half of the season, when he has returned after after that layoff, um, he he's one who, yeah, certainly enhanced his prospects. He played on Kalsha Deer in the grand final, probably didn't have the game he would have liked there. But outside of that, I thought his last four or five games were very, very good and certainly maintained him on a on a good trajectory. His, his height is probably the one thing that people question, but I think he plays a little bit taller than he is just with how physical he is and how well he reads the ball. So he's one that's certainly in contention, as is Tyson Truck, whose last three or four games in particular really did him no harm whatsoever. So he's one who is given a bit of a licence to take it on by foot. He plays off halfback. He's a, he's a game-changing sort of halfback when he's in there, and he's an in-and-under midfielder as well who doesn't mind the rough and tumble and he's, he's as coachable a kid as they've got at Eastern from all reports, so that's another thing working in his favour. And certainly with a couple of those performances in the final series, there were there were phones ringing off the hook about him in Rangers land. Oh, well, that grand final performance, especially his, his ability and his willingness to take the game on, especially that last quarter when everything was on the line, I yeah. think just brought out the best of him. Yep. I just I, I want to go back a little bit to two other defenders in that back line, in Braden LaPlanche and Josh Tovian. We saw a lot with Laplanche. He had his moments throughout the season. He's he's that powerful. He's aggressive in that on that half back row, and he did, I would say, at over fifty percent of the time, dominate his opponent and really get front position. And I'm interested to see your thoughts on him and Josh Toby as well. One that I really liked, uh, probably it was against Standing on on a really wet day in Frankston, where I thought he just showed all his capabilities really well and. His ability to work off his opponent, get to the contest, spoil it, and those second efforts. The thing that let him down at times was, you know, when you're going to get off your opponent, you do take that risk of the ball going, you know, out the back and the forward getting a hold of that. But I'm interested interested to see what you thought of their seasons and what's the potential with them moving forward. Yeah, I think the, uh, so. They're the two co-captains, so both of them have that leadership element. Is the first thing to touch on. Uh, Josh Tove is one who. The leadership was talked about quite a lot within the Eastern Rangers, just with how well he sort of sets up the back line and, and reads the play. He's one who, in that preliminary final, was immense for them. He he hardly lost a, lost a contest all day and took so many of those intercept marks. He's so aerially confident, like you say, and he, he reads the game well enough and has that natural instinct to know when to sort of peel off his man most of the time. And, and Braden LaPlanche is one who can also play forward, as we saw at the start of the season. That game I'll talk about with Trembath, I think, was one where uh, Braden LaPlanche had three or four shots on goal and probably played his best game as a forward, but probably didn't reach the heights he probably would have liked this season, which which means he may have to go through the VFL to to reach the the top league if if he if he has that intent. So he, he's one that's still there or thereabouts, but probably didn't quite uh, have the season he would have liked. Um, and then just a couple. Of others that are that are getting some some little nibbles and interest as well. It, um, obviously, Riley Weatherall is one that we've both enjoyed watching. He's a key forward who's 
last six or seven weeks of the season, perhaps even slightly longer, I think he showed his ability to be that go-to man for Eastern inside 50. He took on the responsibility multiple times. He kicked a couple of goals early in the grand final, which looked to set the scene for Eastern, obviously didn't quite materialise that way. And then Lockie Voss was able to get on top of him. But I think most of the time he was able to beat his defender one-on-one, uh, particularly in that, his last couple of months of the season when he was questioned a little bit about how much he could stand up. And, yeah, I, I really enjoyed watching him. He was named Easton's player of the finals, I think, to evidence how well he did finish the season. And then also Liam George, a clever little forward who played for Halebury and, and was really important in their charge to the premiership, who got a little bit of nibble late and is one I'll be interested to track. He's probably more more suited to, to VFL or more likely to go down the VFL path. But, yeah, nonetheless, a, a pretty impressive talent league season when he was playing either side of school footy. Yeah, we did see a bit of him and what he what he was capable of towards the end, especially in that final series. I guess segueing on that VFL path, I guess those players that just sort of sit a bit under, What's who who's in that category in terms of maybe VFL next season, returning as a 19-year-old, but those yeah. type of areas. Yeah, so I think Remy McLean's one who I'd love to see return as a 19-year-old. So he was a really selfless defender. It's his first season back there and he's still a little bit raw, but had some really big assignments on the opposition spearhead and generally made a good account of himself. But given he is raw in that position, they're hoping to see another season of him as a 19-year-old. Isaac Tanzan, that's been one of your favourites to watch. Obviously a yeah. goal sneak and really consistent. He's one who'll go and play VFL if he wants it. He'll certainly get that opportunity. And then a couple of others who are still getting some AFL interest, but if not, they'll certainly be on a VFL list next year. Uh, Ry Cantwell, who had a broken wrist at the start of the season, which hindered his momentum throughout the season, but he's he's really powerful. He's really good overhead, and, and we saw him on a wing as well as off half forward this year. And then also Cam Nyko, who's really tough and, and puts his body on the line, but had some injuries and probably didn't quite find the form for long enough that he would have liked. But nonetheless, he still represented Vic Metro, so and he's still in those discussions. Well, a lot to look forward to next year. I mean, there's so many names we can go through. Cody Anderson, I mean, Christian Moraes is probably the one to... And Josh Smiley, obviously. Those two are the main ones that we yeah. sort of turn our attention to. And both got a feature on Grand Final Day, which and both played extremely well. Smiley, was, it was his first game back since he injured his shoulder. Uh, about eight weeks before, yeah. and so it was good to see him come back, play some good football, and Murray, as we know how dangerous he can be out of those centre stoppages. Guess some others you're looking forward to see in that bottom age bracket next year? Yeah, just to clarify, so those two boys got the feature on AFL Grand Final Day, Josh Smiley missing the Talent League Grand Final, like you yeah. said, with the hamstring yeah. injury. Um, yeah, so some others that looking forward to seeing. Jack Baldwin, who played a, who played a really handy game in the Vic Diversity versus Basha Hooley Academy, which was also played in grand final week is is one who'll be a really important part of their back line next season. I touched on Remy McLean, who could return next season. One who they're very confident will return next season is a Hawthorne Next Generation Academy member in Illaru Smith, whose in, who's, uh, season this year was completely curtailed by injury. He didn't get on the park. I think he played a half of local footy, and that was about it, just due to a shoulder injury, and, and then he had a delayed start to his season already. So that was a real shame, but he's a 199-centimetre key position player who clubs will lick their lips for potentially in the mid-season draft next year if we're going to cast that far forward. And then some others. We saw Seth McDonald was quite creative on grand final day, um, talent league grand final day, that is, got a couple of goals, and he's one I look forward to seeing next year. Jack Ryan works hard off half forward as well, and then Riley White is also in that mix. But yeah, certainly the midfield is is the is gonna be their one wood next year with Cody Anderson being the bull, Christian Moraes being that that player that's really slippery in traffic, and then Josh Smiley being another really big bodied, powerful player in there. We'll move now to the Western Jets who probably had the the hardest season out of the Metro teams, but there were still some good glimpses and Logan Morris is obviously the main talking point of this conversation and he's one we've We've like we've kind of debated on this podcast before in terms of where he sits between the key position forwards in this draft mm-hmm. crop, and I guess the other one to chat about, and I'll, and I'll let you start with him, is Lockie MacArthur, who has definitely increased his his draft prospect chances quite a lot in the back end of the season, and we saw him he's got a chance on testing day. So, sort of tell us a bit why he's in this position at the moment. Yeah, he his athletic profile is excellent and he's versatile, so he's able to play at both ends of the ground. He can play as that third 
key forward. He's he's able to fly for the ball, really backs himself. He's quick. He reads the ball really well. But then he can also go back and defend really well as well, reads the ball coming in and plays plays on his man. And a little bit like I talk about Josh Tovey, backs himself to take the intercept mark and peel off and, and understands when to do that. I think the best example of that was against Sandy when he took six or seven intercept marks. And, and yeah, he's also played on a couple of different types of opponents uh, as well and shown that he, he can do it man-on-man man against them. So Conor O'Sullivan against Murray, he played on him and did really well. And obviously we know we know the way that Conor O'Sullivan's built, but he's also played on some smaller forwards as well and and been able to match it with them on the ground. So he he's one who has stood up to a little bit of adversity that Western have been faced with this season just with some results. And he's shown also at school level, you know, a difficult team you know he, he's playing for pegs who finished at the lower end of the agsv ladder but it was still their main source to goal and kick multiple goals most weeks so yeah he's one that at his height and with his athletic profile is is the is the other one to watch probably doesn't quite get drafted but he's one they hope will return as a 19 year old because he he hasn't even had a full footy pre-season yet and he still shows so, so many glimpses that's just because he's so high up with his cricket as well. He's he's played um, some pretty pretty high level representative cricket, and then I, I suppose just a couple of others just worth touching on from a top age point of view. Jake Smith, uh, we've talked about him, and and he's one who had a real responsibility as an inside midfielder to set the tone for them. So they probably did lack a little bit of size in there, but he's a he's a big body. He, he's not necessarily tall, but he's really tough. And I think Weston thought that was a real asset of his. Clubs probably want to see a little bit more of him on the outside, but he got to go for Williamstown as well and and actually gave a good account of himself. He only got three disposals, but speaking to people at Williamstown, they were reasonably satisfied with how he went. The ball just didn't bounce his way on the day. And then Jovan Petrick will no doubt get a VFL contract next year. He played down back for Western this year and also got a game for Collingwood's VFL side. Well, and before I move to next year's boys, back to Logan Morris, your honest stance, where does he sit in those, in those key forward Key position forward players. Where does he sit for you? Uh, he sits probably. He sits. Uh, I, I, he sits a lot higher than what a lot of people have him as. I, I, I'd have him definitely. I'd have him comfortably in the top five key forwards in in the talent league. And then on to the bottom majors. We've actually chatted to one of these bottom majors already, but touch on who are we going to see next year? We saw a few of these boys at national championships level already. Yeah, we saw, well, we spoke to Keaton Martify Forbes and he's one that they're, they're pretty hopeful for. So he had a hamstring injury and probably would otherwise have played in the under-17s match out at Werribee earlier in the year uh, um, yeah. as a as a yeah, as a yeah key forward who, who takes marks and, and can kick a really long ball. Yeah, you talk about someone who played national championships, obviously Luca Grego, he got the game playing for Vic Metro and was was pretty was pretty good off half back and is one that will get some time in the midfield next year as an ultimate professional from all reports out of Western and then just a couple of others to touch on. Massimo Razzo, his center of gravity is really low, which really helps him as a player and he is quite small, but he's so clean and that's something that really stands out. I've watched him on wet days of footy, I've watched him on dry days of footy, I've watched him when it's windy. He always knows how the ball's going to bounce and and is one that works on his fundamentals a lot, but it's also comes to him quite naturally. And then Daniel Snell, another one to keep an eye on. He really impressed me in that under-17 showcase game. He's got a really good athletic profile, good lead, which makes him really good aerially and kicks it quite nicely as well. So those are the four players to, to probably keep an eye on from a bottom age perspective. And yeah, that's hard to split them. I'm excited to watch all of them. And it's good to see that there are, I guess, little little diamonds uh, coming through for Western because they did obviously only have really Logan this year. And then there was probably a bit of a drop off thereafter. Well, just wanted to mention as well, Luca did get his chance on. He played on AFL Grand Final Day as well and had yep. some good moments as that rebound in halfback who did did push forward quite a lot with his running patterns. We'll move now to Sandy, the premiers of this year. They've gone back to back, which is pretty impressive. Yeah. Not sure not sure when the last team, last talent league team has went back to back. So impressive feat from them. But I mean, yeah, we're, it's it's probably the most loaded lineup in terms of Chances to get drafted, but we'll start. Yeah, we'll start top end. Yep. I mean, Riley Sanders is the obvious one there. Not not a lot to even add with him. But looking at him, both of us honestly said this at the start of the year. We thought he hadn't improved in the off season. That was our initial thought. We, you know, we saw him a lot last year, and he 
deemed the first sort of the start. He didn't seem as if there was improvement, but he just from that point onwards, it was nuts from him. And I'm I'm sure you'd agree with that. I think he's one who really used the year really well, and it's probably yeah. the the archetype of what you hope a draftee uses their top eight year for. Now, obviously, yeah. there's other things mentally that come into it, and there's the pressures to deal with. But he he started the year, and yeah, I, like I was probably lower on him than most people. I'm happy to admit that. But that he did start the year with a couple of little question marks over him, and and yeah. since then he's he's really answered all of them. You know, in terms of his power, in terms of his explosiveness, his inside craft, his versatility his ability to win the ball, his his ability to take an overhead mark is also really impressive. He, he, he's just shown absolutely everything and gone from, you know, someone who people thought, you know, probably maybe goes in the first round to being that top five, top ten probable, if not lock. So, yeah, a really impressive season from him. Charlie Edwards used school footy to really put himself on the map, got to go against Dandenong for Sandringham in a Melbourne Grammar bye, I believe. And, yeah, really shone there and then was part of the Sandy Dragons engine room for the rest of the year. Ollie Murphy, the key defender, the Vic Metro MVP, and Archie Roberts, the rebounding halfback, who's been a staple for Sandy and Halebury for the last two seasons, will also certainly get drafted. And then you look at your next year down, and, and yeah, there's a fair few in there. So you've got Harvey Johnston, who who's probably thereabouts and he's probably more likely than not to to get drafted but it is still some question marks over whether he does he's obviously played as that half forward links up really well gets high up the ground is really good culturally Tarkin O'Leary's 2k time trial proved how good he is you talk a lot on this podcast about how good his kicking is I think that's a real underrated element of his game matches up well on the wing Cal Shadir's last couple of games really showed what he's capable of from an athletic point of view he probably has a lot more goals to his name if he doesn't miss some set shots here and there throughout the year but his ability to take marks and fly is really impressive can also pinch it in the rough Vigo Vizantini projected to grow to 205 centimeters clubs licking their lips over what they can get there as a young ruck that they can develop obviously his brother Dante already listed at Port Adelaide and has played a little bit of AFL footy and then Luke Lloyd famously kicked 19 goals for (laughs) DLSL that's one that's got uh, a lot of uh, media attention already, but he has also played a couple of games for Frankston with his brother Joe and, yeah, yeah looked reasonably confident there. And, yeah, he's, he's really good mark. And, um, yeah, he's one that I'm looking forward to, to seeing what, what eventuates of him because I think after an injury-interrupted start, he, he showed all elements of what he's capable of. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll just sort of sort of touch again on those boys and just give my sort of opinion on them. But... Tarkin's probably the one in there. Um, I think there's a lot of value there if you're an AFL club. That, and, he's, and he's probably one you spend a year or two developing. And he's he's just got all the elements where you can really use him as a utility that can just provide that run. His kicking, was it's, it's been sensational since the start of the year. That ability to switch the ball on the run, like 45-degree angles, Good vision, uh, yeah. Good vision. It's good vision that I think is very valuable and, and it, it lacks a lot at this level at this time. But, you know, obviously there's so much room for development. And then, I, I you know, I'm glad Harvey is getting that interest because he did, uh, and I think it's his forward, it's his forward craft that is so impactful sometimes where he'll go in there and he'll kick a goal. He'll just yep. do his role when he moves forward. And, and, and energises the team. He celebrates the goal. Everyone yeah. gets around him. And, like that can't be understated as well how important that is. Yeah, that just that that general leadership from Harvey as well. He, yeah, that that's something you want on an AFL list. Kalsha, yeah, I mean, I agree what you said. He he knows how to get the footy. He knows how to get it in his hands. His contested work is good. It's that goal kicking he just needs to work on. Vigo, we saw good glimpses. We know what he can provide. And yeah, if you're projecting two oh five, you'd you'd very much like that. And then you know, I always laugh when you bring up the Luke Lloyd nineteen goal scene. It's just. That's quite funny, but it's a good thing to have. But we'll move now to the others that are sort of in that region. Could, could not. Still, you know, yeah. VFL at the very least, you'd assume, but yeah. there's still a good chance. I'll, I'll let you start with the first one on this list, which is Charlie Harrop, because yeah. you've been keeping a good good eye on him all year. And where's he sort of sit at this point in time? I feel really bad for Charlie Harrop, um, personally, just because I think if he did get to play those last four or five games, he would have been a little bit higher than where he currently sits just injured himself in Halebury's last game of the season once they'd already wrapped up the premiership he's obviously the skipper there and played some really nice footy and was pretty good in the first month for Sandy but only got back for Sandy's last two games the prelim final and the grand final 
Uh, so missed four games in the end of Talent League footy that he would ordinarily have played. But he's really hard working. He was really good at the national championships with Vic Metro. Kicked three goals in one game and and sees the game really early. So before the ball's even in his hands, he almost knows what he's going to do with it. And then he's able to to quickly execute that kick or, or, you know, put a teammate into space. Has that really high footy IQ, which can't be understated. And he's a good marking forward. So this is where I think him and I'll touch on Will Brown in a second as well. They're both really crafty, and I think the, the I guess, drawback of, of playing for Sandy, obviously you're playing in front of recruiters and you're playing for a really good team who, who's organised, well-structured, et cetera, and under a really good coach in Rob Harding, but they had so many key forwards that they were probably the ones that did have to play a little bit smaller. And, yeah, and, and the ball didn't always go to them, where in another forward line they might have been the focal point or the second player that it went to rather than the fifth or sixth. But, yeah, no, I really like Charlie Harrop's season. Will Brown... His leadership really good. I thought when he was in the midfield, he he showed how good he can be as a clearance player. Didn't drive his legs. You know, that's been talked about ad nauseum now, but obviously had the ankle injury. So probably a little bit unlucky in that regard. But I, I still think he's got so much to offer as a 194, 195 centimetre midfielder. He's one who's grown since last season and, and as a crafty forward as well. He, he knows where to lead to. He, he's got really instinctive forward craft. He can take a good mark. And we saw his ability to convert on the big stage on grand final day. And he, and he played well in the 2022 grand finals we talked about as well. And then a couple of others that would probably be around the mark if, if we had more draft numbers than what we're expecting, which is probably around that 55 mark this year. If we did have, you know, close to that 70 guys like Cooper Lord, who's that defensive running mid who was really good all season. Billy McGee, Gallen Birdie, who's kept Nick Watson quite at school level and also on grand final day. Matt Carroll, who's shown he can be a rebounding and a shutdown defender. And Lockie Voss, who had an injury-interrupted campaign but played on some big names and kept them reasonably quiet. Riley Weatherill and Nate Caddy included. Also, there are thereabouts. I mean, I just want to touch on Billy McGee and Birdie. I, I think maybe it's an out-there opinion, but I feel like if he was in another side that probably wasn't stacked with as much talent, he would be talked about quite a lot more. I just think what you get with him is like just those 1% efforts that really lift it. And, and they make a big difference in a, in a team with such talent. You can notice it. But he was terrific. I just thought the things he did, they could have been noticed even more. And they might be noticed even more. We don't know. So I was just looking at the run sheet. There's 13 players I'll run through before I get to Billy McGee, Gallen Birdie. So I think that really highlights your point. Yeah. That, yeah, in a team like like Western, they they probably really talking him up and, and talking about what he can do, really doing everything they can to promote him. But, yeah, in Sandy, there's just, you know, you've got to promote everyone. And, and yeah. you know, recruiting, you're talking about so many different players. But, um, yeah. yeah, certainly. Yeah, he's one I did enjoy watching. And, and yeah, I know the, the game at Geelong, you, you saw him. And, yeah, he, that started a really strong vein of form in his final series. I was there in the week. It was a week before, I think, against Oakley, the last regular season game where he just built a terrific yep. final series, hundred yep. percent. And then, yeah, Cooper Lord is one that those that defensive presence is that defensive midfielder. He's just so strong in the contests, and nothing really gets past him. And he was great to watch as well. We'll move now to sort of the, that VFL category. Yeah, and a few here that had their moments throughout the year. Miles Enders is one we saw a bit earlier in the year, and got his chance at the Vic Metro trials and actually didn't play too bad in hindsight. It wasn't yep. poor, poor trials. Didn't get a spot in the champs. What do you make of his season in general? Will, I mean, if it, if he had made the champs, do you think this was a, this is a, this is a different story Completely given he didn't actually story. have that bad of a Completely trial. different story. And then again, the, the humorous thing is some of the players that probably kept him out of the, of the Vic Metro squad were probably Sandy Dragons teammates because of yeah how yeah. stacked they are from a tall forward perspective. But yeah, and, and then he he you know, didn't get back to play for Sandy Dragons at all, partially because of a groin injury, and then partially because of how many marking forwards that Sandy had. But yeah, he played the first four games of the season. He's a chance to return as a 19 year old, really good mark. Yeah. And yeah, I think he he's he, those last couple of games for Sandy, although he only played four, I thought from round one to round four, his ability to get up the ground and and I guess uh, provide uh, provide an outlet and also set up scores rather than be on the end of it was something that, that really improved. Then you've also got some others around the mark there as well. Nate Sullivan, really disciplined backman. Ethan Williams played as a as a really good winger in the last couple of games, but probably showed his best footy yeah. as a as a lockdown defender. Levi Young played the prelim final and actually played with a cracked rib 
and he is one who is a brother of Logan Young, who was at Sandy a couple of years ago, who will be on a VFL list, I think. He's a ruckman. And Archer May, Key Ford, who's Richmond VFL list for this year, 19-year-old. Yeah, well, Archer May had a pretty good season. I think his season yeah. was pretty underrated. And, yeah, I mean, he's already got that, that VFL spot. So I'm sure he'll slot in very well. I mean, and, again, we look next year, and it's sort of the same story for Sandy as it is every year. It's... You know, got a pretty good list to choose from and we go through the names I mean I have to start with Levi Ashcroft he is yep. in my book the number one pick next year and you sort of hear Jagger and Finno Sullivan in those talks I think he goes at one at the moment yep. he's just nuts to watch and then we just keep going through this list Murphy Reed, Taj Hodden, Luke Trainer. where do you start well where's your starting point with these bottom majors next year uh, my starting point is still Levi Ashcroft. You're probably going to go one yeah. just the Brisbane father son and, you know, yeah. don't get bid on a one. But yeah, uh, Murphy Reed, I'm really excited to watch. We saw what he could do on King's birthday against Oakley. I think that was the best showcase of his talent. Uh, and yeah, the two boys. You mentioned Josh Dolan, obviously playing as a high half forward, got a game in, in, in on grand final day ahead of Taj Hotton. So I think that shows how, how important a role he's going to play next year, a Brighton grammar player. And then Harrison Oliver is one I know you, you've talked a little bit about. Sam Marshall who played Brisbane VFL as a 16-year-old this year. He's a Brisbane he's a Brisbane Academy kid, so he'll start the season with Brisbane and then link up with Sandy. Jet Hayata is a young sort of, I guess, live wire on the wing, half-forward type, type area. Yeah. And then yeah. Jack Cheat is one who didn't play at all this year for Sandringham, but he's, he's going to develop into a really good key defender and will play a key role for them next year also worth touching on Ned McGuinness who it's hoped will return next year and and that's sort of looking like likely is a smaller frame sort of player who with this talent that Sandy had just didn't get an opportunity once at the end of school season Uh, so he had some opportunities at the start of the season but then just couldn't work his way back into the lineup but he's obviously a fourth on father son Uh, so yeah one to keep an eye on there but we'll move on to, to Calder they've obviously got Another father-son, Jordan Croft, at the top of their tree. He's a key forward who covers the ground really well. Who else have they got? Yeah, well, you're right. Uh, Jordan Croft is probably the only certainty in for Calder at this yep. point in time, you'd think. There's a, I mean, there's a few on the brink, and I'll start with Ryan Eyre, who had, did some really good things. He's, his top-end ability, like, is probably some of his it, – it's very strong, but he yep. just does fall away at some, you know, at, in some elements of his game. Could be a Category B rookie because he is part of the Essendon NGA. So yeah. there is every possibility there, but he also could come back as a 19-year-old. But just played some good football through the middle of the ground. It was It's just that tough, competitive, smaller midfielder that Calder were always relying on and he would, and he would always do the job. Hugo Garcia, love to hear your thoughts on what his season was because had a strong start, had a strong finish, a very good competitor. He was driven. He we went in the half forward line at time, in the forward line at times, and was making an impact. What do you think of his season? Yeah, I liked it. Um, like you said, start strong start, strong finish, and in between he played school footy. So yeah, dream season I think because you know got to play with his mates in between some really good talent league footy. Yeah, applied himself off half forward initially when he went into the midfield. He showed he could match it there physically at under eighteen level, and showed I think from a stoppage craft point of view he was really good as well. So I, I think he should be talked about more highly than what he has been so far. He's met with a few clubs and is one that, yeah, it could be could be a late to rookie selection. I think he'd be an absolute steal just based on the the hard work and the way he applies himself according to those around him. And yeah, he, to be honest, he's probably been, uh, yeah, if I was to pick a top 10, who, who I think are underrated, if I was to pick a top five, I was picked a top three, who I think are underrated. Yeah, but, you know. yeah no, I, 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 gr- I mean, I've always sort of been that, he just hasn't shown enough at times, but I can I, I can 100% agree with your point of view on as well. I think he's really yeah. powerful. There's all the I mean, there's still a good chance he does he does go, and with that interest, you never know. Ryan Brody is one who came in in the middle of the year. He had a broken collarbone, so he didn't really get a lot of time yeah, okay. to build into his season, and he had no time in a development pathway program until this year. But yep. he's got very good athletic profile and probably matches up with some of the best halfbacks in the talent league. So there's a lot of advocating for him to come back as a 19-year-old next year. So probably one to watch and one that could be in bigger discussions if he had a full year of football. Charles Bolmat, hold well in the 
club's BNF and had a really good year as a rebounding defender, probably gets listed on a, v, on a VFL list and could come back as a 19-year-old, but just has a good offensive and defensive balance. Rye Penny is one we talked about earlier in the year. He came back as a 19-year-old this year. Should go back to Collingwood's VFL where he played some of his football. And Min Naeem, one that you talked to early in the year. We've got a feature with him on the on the channel. If you want to check out Instagram, that feature is on there. He hit the scoreboard. He was good over there. He was taking some good contested marks. Had a few positional changes, but probably just doesn't have that X factor to get yeah. him into the AFL, but definitely a VFL for sure. And then Moody Taha is one that I quite loved watching. And, you know, when you just you, when you compare him to the rest, he just probably just can't climb higher or get above anyone. But he was really good. He's just that that energy that energy inside the contest where he'd just go in, get the footy, get out. He's one that I loved watching. Lateral movement really good, and I think they wanted yeah. to see a bit, bit of him, his ability to power away from stoppage at the start of the season, and and perhaps didn't do that as much as he could have. But I, I really like his story for Vic Metro as well. He was a late call up and then played really well, I think, against South Australia yeah. and got a couple of games there. And yeah, I don't think he he's done anything other than show what all his traits are. So I, I've really liked watching him. Next year, obviously. Isaac Kako is one I've talked about. I think I put him on the forecast right at the start of the year, saying I think he'll lead the goal kicking this year. Obviously got that yeah. LCL injury, which hindered him. Uh, but, yeah, no, I, I thought he had a pretty good season and will be that live wire, that really watchable, complete package, small forward, like what Nick Watson was this year. He's a little bit taller than what Nick Watson is. Um, so he's he's been probably my favourite bottom major from Calder to watch. Uh, then you've obviously got some other names, Jaden New and Nash King. Tell us a bit about these boys. Well, I think Calder may be the Dandenong of next year in terms of Dandenong in 2022 had so many bottom ages get a game, and especially towards, you know, when they went on their their finals run, they had a lot of bottom ages, and then they brought them into this year. They'll Calder are pretty much in that same boat next year. And there's a lot to love. Kako, you sort of touched on, I mean, he'll play a bit more on the wing, just that ability to show he yeah. can work up the ground a lot yep. more. You talked on Jaden Nguyen, who is going to be my favourite player probably to watch, and he was up there this year. He's just so fun on the wing, that burst he provides. He's just so smart with footy in hand, knows how to get himself involved and not not bring the pressure towards him. Nice, like, terrific kick. He'll be and terrific to watch. Kid. a terrific kid as yeah. well. He's really respectful from all reports out of quarter. Yeah, he's just one that I'm very excited to see how his football progresses. And, like, I think champs level is where he'll just... You, yeah. You'll see so like what he's capable of. Nashkin plays the game instinct, instinctively, just really good ball skills. He's an agile agile midfielder. His stoppage work is just like that upper echelon that will just elevate yeah. him above the rest next year. And he played on grand final day, played a bit of a halfback role, which was actually the first time he ever played in that role. So it was good to see him exposed into that position and could potentially play a little bit of his footy at Calder on the halfback line. So, But it was good to see his versatility because he did play well. Harry O'Farrell is one that I thought was top five on grand final day and probably went a bit under underrated in the end. And He's got the height to be that really tall, like probably similar to what Ollie Murphy has done this year. And, and he's already at a higher level at this point in time and should build really well. But it, I guess it's where he's going to be used next year and just providing the aerial presence he could play as a forward. So positional changes there. Yep. Pat said, really good performer, played a good end of the year. Good, interesting to see what he does. And then no, Damon Hollow, Noah Scott too, that keep your eye on. I mean, Noah Scott is one I sort of saw earlier in the year. I think he's got a lot of potential. I think it's whether he just has to find that X factor next year and – He's because he doesn't have the height, so interesting yeah. to see what he does. But I think Calder could possibly be a premiership contender. I don't want to go too early, but they've got, uh, but, they've yeah, got but, a lot of talent. Great. I think it's just great for that region to have so yeah, many stuff and always the Oakleys and the Sandys of the world. But yeah, they're certainly going to have the depth, if not AFL wise. And you can see, you know, a yeah. lot of those boys, and, and there's always others in pre season who apply themselves who can get onto VFL lists. So that's really good. Uh, Damon Hollow, in particular, is one I've really enjoyed watching. He's, he's um, one who had a really good game in that under-17 showcase. So, yeah, lots of upside there. Oakley we'll move on to now. And, and Harvey Thomas is one who really captures my attention just because he 
he hasn't let the, I guess, the positional changes and the lack of continuity with the team his teams he's been playing in hinder his footy at all. It's obviously something that all draft prospects have to grapple with in their top age year. But him in particular, he's played across all three lines. He's played for GWS Academy, GWS VFL, <laughs> AFL. Uh, he's played for Oakley. He's played for Caulfield. He's played for uh, uh, the Allies. So that's that's a lot of teams. He's played across half back. He's played in the midfield. He's played on the wing. And he's played a half forward. <laughs> So, yeah, just basically I don't reckon there, there would have been two or three games in a row at any point of the season where he's either played for the same side or played in the same position, which is a testament to him. But, yeah, he's a, he's a tough competitor. He's, he's pretty small, but no one talks about his height just because of how well he does compete. Um, he's really fearless, and he's got a, a really good skill set. I think he's best suited off half forward. He's probably a little bit small to be going into the midfield straight away. And he obviously yep. played half back for the Allies, but I think what he showed off half forward for Oakley against Sandy, kicked four goals, really put him on the map and, and asserted how 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 good he really is. And then they've obviously got some others. Oakley, Nathan Falaktai started the year with a lot of hype around him. Probably didn't have the season he would like as that rebounding run and gun defender. They tried to show him a little bit as a lockdown player, play him a little bit deeper, and they shook, and they ran him through the midfield as well. But, you know, he's got a couple of little things that he would have liked to have done better in terms of his kicking and, and then injured himself uh, in Oakley's last game. Um, his shoulder, he is expected to be OK for day one of preseason. And just with how good he is athletically, I expect he'll get onto an AFL list and he will be a good rebounder. Just probably didn't, didn't quite reach the heights he would have liked this year. One who did, though, Conan Brown. I thought yeah. his big Metro campaign was really impressive. That game at RSEA Park was outstanding. Clearance midfielder who reads it off the ruck's hands and can move through traffic well, despite being a sort of more slightly built player. Well, he did win the Metro MVP. Yep. Even though we didn't, I mean that that was one where we, yeah, it was a bit unexpected. He so just, so just to just to clarify, Ollie Murphy won the Metro MVP. This is coaches um, coaches voted on a separate Metro MVP. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there's a few of them. There's a few of them too. But yeah, he he was probably their best performer. Throughout the year, just consistent consistency. Yep. Consistency kept him in conversation and didn't let him slide at all. I want to just quickly ask a question to Harvey Thomas. Where do you think his best position is? Because yep. personally, I think it's in that as that forward. That yeah. like that game against Sandy was just yeah. electric. Just the he knows how to win his own football, and he's so deadly with it as well. He does not waste his opportunities, but. Agree or yeah, agree. He's got that. He's got that goal sense as well, and and yeah, I think as that small forward who, who's crumbing front and center is, is what he do does best, and he's also got reasonable running capacity as well. Um, and then and then probably just just a couple of others just to round it out. Ollie Barter a little bit interrupted this year with injury, and obviously schoolboy footy as well. Started as a as a rebounding halfback. Um, and they wanted to show him a little bit as a small forward at the end of the season, did a hamstring, wasn't able to do that, but still got the combine invites. So there's a little bit of interest there, but they want him to return as a 19-year-old, see what he can do as a small forward if if that if that opportunity presents itself, if he doesn't get drafted. Then they've obviously got Boston Dowling, a 19-year-old who played for Murray last year, and he's still very raw. He'd be taken as a project player if he was taken. He probably isn't. He's probably got to develop in the VFL, but showed a couple of little nice signs. And then Will Lorenz as well, a wingman who played for the country and, uh, again, probably didn't quite reach the heights he would have liked this season. There was still enough to like in terms of the attributes he's got at his best to probably AFL standard. And then some that will play VFL, I think Liam Walters, who got a state combine invite, Will Elliott, the key forward and last year's captain, Jet Hartman, the strong defender, and Luke Teal, who returned as a 19-year-old after having a little bit of AFL interest last year, all go on to VFL. Then we look at next year and... Again, they want this is a team that will compete very, very well, and well, they'll compete well for the first four rounds, and then the last yeah. four rounds. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's another way to look at it. But yeah, you you look at their top end and Jagger Smith, Finn Sullivan, Tom Gross. It's it's yeah. very stacked. But sort of interested after that. I mean, yeah. we, we saw Pat Reschko. His back end of the year was phenomenal. He his yep. ability in the midfield, that transitional presence. He knew how to move the ball forward and find the space, present, you know, find forwards who were presenting well. And he was one that I thought just gave you every every good glimpse you need to see at that point in time. Yeah, whether he's playing off half back, whether he's playing elsewhere, I thought he was really yeah. good. And yeah, just yeah, coming back from an ACL injury, as we've touched on, was 
one who, yeah, will hit his traps next season. I think Charlie Richardson is a hard-working half forward. Another one, Lucas Toby, who was thrown back this season, having never played there previously, given a little bit of a boost. I think that's where he'll play next season. He'll he'll lock down some really good key forwards. Looked really looked really good there, playing on Archer Reed in particular. And then a few others. Doug Kerr is a is good overhead. He'll play in defence. He's a schoolboy. Luke Quainer. Collingwood NGA player, obviously the brother of Collingwood Premiership player. Isaac Quainer plays a similar role, obviously a rebounding halfback. Kobe Askew, a small forward who has shown some positive signs, has that sort of craftiness inside 50. And then Tyg McCarthy, who I thought played a really good game in that under-17 showcase, reads the ball in the air really well. Well, you'd be pretty happy with another Quainer coming through the ranks. I don't know. There's a question without notice. Is he one that, is that you know, that if... He goes top 40, Collingwood can't bid. Yeah, yeah, he's a Collingwood. Okay. Yeah. So interesting to see what happens with him next year. And we'll finish on Northern, who had a pretty good season. And they were actually probably one of the best teams in the competition in terms of just the, the, the team itself connected really well. And a few to talk about, and it's probably only Nate Caddy. Oh, Nate Caddy and Will Green are the, yeah. the two main ones. And Nate Caddy, we sort of, we've had our mixed opinions. We had a pretty good year. and. We know what he's capable of. It's, I think it's whether he translate that translates that to AFL form. Wait and see. But Will Green as well. He was terrific. He was probably in my eyes the best ruck forward player. That that type who was just so versatile. He would go up forward, but the height doesn't seem to be a factor. It's just part of him, and it's just a part of his game that just seems to use it as he's as if he's a midfielder at times. The way he moves, and he was terrific. But I guess a few. Others that are in around talks, and Christian Mardini is probably the first one that yep. we saw good glimpses of at Metro level, and him and Ollie Murphy obviously had that yep. combination at times. We saw it in Queensland when they went up to play the Allies. I'm interested to see your thoughts on him because he does have that, he's got that marking presence. He knows how to win one-on-ones. Where do you see him compared to the other fullbacks in this yeah, so many of these fullbacks, it's their first season playing fullback. They've grown up as yeah. a key forward all their life, and he's another one of those. And I think for someone who's playing their first season as a key defender, he was really good, like you said. And um, I probably see him as one that, yeah, probably needs to go through the, the VFL um, just with where he sits at the moment. But having said that, I think, yeah, like I think he summed it up really well. He's aerially really competent. He's obviously the captain of Northern, I believe, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's he's certainly one who has has the attributes at his best. Did he show it uh, consistently enough throughout the year? Probably not, and that comes with the fact that he's a little bit unfamiliar with the position and, and still learning. But, yeah, and I really like watching him. And then I guess Christian Ferranado is one who we've talked about quite a lot on this podcast. He's a, he's a ball winner. He's a bull in the midfield. Where do you sort of see him? He got a state combine invite. Yeah, well, I think with him, it's just... I think he may be one of the best, and I I would say top five in the whole talent league in terms of his inside work, his ability to win it out of the centre stoppages, just his stoppage work in general. It's one of the best you might see. It's just where's the versatility with him? Can you put him on the outside? Can you put him up forward? You probably can't, and that's just the player he is. So I just – he's obviously getting some interest with that invite. I just don't know if you can – develop him any more than what he is. So he's he's a terrific player in the in what he's good at. It's just yeah. outside of that, I'm not too sure. But he had a very good season. It was you have to get interest with that type of season where you're playing that consistently and that good. It's probably just a question of versatility. I guess a few others two others I just want to touch on who had pretty good seasons and I think they deserve the recognition and should get VFL at the very least. Alexander Diaro Played very good football, I thought. Just that really quick runner drives his legs out of stoppages and could play as an in, on the inside, but also on the win as well. He provided great run. It was a really nice ball user by foot and by hand in chains going forward in transition. And then Parker Heatley is one that you'd love to have on your team in terms of just that tough physical defender that sticks up for his teammates. Similar to a Braden Maynard type, actually, just the way he yeah. plays his football. Yeah has just really good defensive instincts and just has nice composure, exit in D50. Probably got a little too angry at times, the way he plays. And look, 
you, you can take that for the way he plays and stands up for his teammates. Probably doesn't get a sh- chance at AFL level, but I think BFL, the opportunity should come up from there. Yeah, just to touch on Alex Darrow, um, I thought what he did well was just his, his ability to stand over the footy and, and attack it. And I thought that was something that was a real feature of his game. He, he was really fearless over the footy. And, yeah, when he was sort of rebounding off half back and, like you say, push up to the wing at times, uh, that's something that for a slightly built player, I thought he did really well. And, and certainly I think his footwork as well is something that was a real feature of his game this year. We'll move on to some bottom majors. Obviously, we saw that Jesse Dottoli and Zach Johnson got the Vic Metro inclusions uh, this year, played on played in that game at RCA Park. And, yeah, they'll they'll spearhead, I guess, the the crop next year for Northern. Oh, 100%. We saw with Dottoli how dangerous he can be, especially in those Vic Metro trials. He really put on a show. He's probably one of the best on that day and played a mm. bit of football towards the end of the year got injured again. So we didn't see too much of him this year, but we know the potential he has. He's very dangerous inside 50, and that's probably where he'll play his best football, but can rotate into the midfield mix. So be interesting. He'll be one that I feel like can do anything and have the capabilities to play everywhere next year. And Zach Johnson has to be one of, again, I'd say that a lot of them are my favourites, but they're fun to watch, these players. Zach Johnson is one I think is very fun to watch. Just a really strong defensively as a midfielder, and I think similar to what we saw with Cooper Lord this year, he sort of has that defensive instincts but knows how to move the ball forward as well and hold his shape really well and just a really good aerial ability, so really excited. Liam Farrah is one that we saw on the under-17 trials game mm. who could have kicked 6-0, but mm. kicked 0-6. We're very interested to see where he goes. What, what did you think of that, day? Because I think there was a lot to take out of that, even though he didn't kick a goal. Knows where to lead and understands how to link up with the midfield. I thought it was really impressive because he hasn't played with any of those midfielders before, yeah. but that midfield connection wasn't a problem with him. He, he obviously not only was able to to get space on his opponent and, and, I guess, lead, but he was able to take the marks. Just the one thing he wasn't able to do was take the chances. You would have seen a bit more of him, but certainly I think he, he did show enough that he was crafty inside 50. If I was just touching something about Zach Johnson as well, I think aerial ability is something we touch on a lot with forwards. Small forwards, are they good overhead? Small defenders, are they able to spoil on closing speed? And we obviously talk about it with key position players needing to be able to reach out and use their height. Something you don't talk about as much for midfielders, but I think it's something that he does really well, like you said. And I think that's something that can be underrated and can be a little bit of a point of difference on other midfielders who's able to take the contested mark. 100%. I'm very excited to see where his football takes him next year because just like he was one of the strongest for Northern throughout the whole year, just stood up time and time again. And then two others to finish on. Christian Lawson, we saw saw some pretty good footy from this year. Really good grunt work on the inside. Just great effort. Drives through the corridor and can produce some good moments going forward. Lucas McInerney is one that you were really interested in, especially in the back end of the year. And I know you were at the wild card game where they played Oakley, where he had a pretty good performance out there. But just really classy on the win and can provide some really good movement in transition. I guess what do you love about him that's just sort of stood out towards the back end? Good schoolboy footy as well. And, yeah, I think he has that, as that, I guess, as that movement in an offensive chain. He's really good. He's yeah. one who can provide that outlet from D50 and then use his legs and, and drive it inside 50 really effectively and, and wins the ball as well, knows how to win the ball. So that's something that's, that's really impressive. But that probably just about sums it up. It does. So that does wrap it up. So that is the full review of every, every team, boys and girls. Make sure to check out the previous videos we have done all of the girls, and then we did a boys' country, and this is obviously the boys' metro. Some exciting videos coming up that I would share on this podcast, but we don't know when they're going to go out, so we'll definitely preview those and give some teasers closer to when they are releasing. But make sure to subscribe and put the notification bell on for when those videos come out or follow our socials. We will preview those videos shortly on the socials. Thank you all for watching. Make sure to subscribe for more, and we'll see you next week.